SQL Server on AWS, why, where, and how. I'm proud to present our speakers, co-founder and CTO at Stratus 10, Kevin Rison Chu, CEO of Learning Upgrade, Vinod Lobo, and Senior Partner Solutions Architect at AWS, Tom Stop. Our agenda will begin with Tom from AWS, providing an overview and business case for SQL Server on AWS. Then Kevin of Stratus 10 will briefly explain Stratus 10's role in migrations as an AWS partner. Vinod of Learning Upgrade will talk about his company's case and experience with AWS. Then Kevin and Vinod will discuss the challenges and benefits of migrating. We'll then open up for more Q&A. Before we jump in, we have a brief poll. Uh, please take a moment to submit your answers. This poll will help our speakers get a feeling for the type of environments we're looking at. I'll wait just a few seconds for results to come in. Just to give you a play-by-play, -play, it looks like most attendees have a majority on-prem SQL Server workloads. Um, some looks like they're running some on AWS. And it uh, looks like majority or more than 50% of SQL Server workloads are running on-prem. Uh, and then how much are you spending on licenses per month? We're a bit all over the board here. Um, a lot of less than 5,000. Um, uh, about a, th a third, five to 50,000, and then about another 10%, 50 to 100,000. Looks like a few answers are still trickling in, um, but again, that's um, about the majority, I would say on-prem and less than 100,000. Okay, I'll be closing the poll in just a moment. Thanks so much. Okay, and now I'll hand it over to Tom. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, thanks for the, the poll information as, as well. It's not surprising. Um, the, I can't remember what the, the latest numbers are, but most estimates say that 70 some percent of SQL Server workloads are, are still on-premises. Um, that's why we're here today to talk about uh, migrating them. So uh, yeah, as, as Catherine said, my name is Tom Staub. Uh, I am a, a partner solutions architect here at AWS. I've been working with SQL Server for many years um, and I, I really enjoy uh, getting out and doing events. It's a little bit different now obviously than it was a few years ago, but, but I like that opportunity and really discussing what the, the key advantages of running SQL Server on AWS. And so let's let's get right into that. Um, and, and honestly, a lot of these advantages are not specific to SQL Server, not even specific to Microsoft workloads. Um, you know, customers such as your, yourselves come to AWS in a lot of cases for the same reasons. They want that extra security. They want you know, more options, they want the, the reliability of, of the system. And in a lot of cases, they're looking for lower cost with the same or better performance, like right? really improving that, that price performance ratio. Um, and regarding that, I understand, you know, SQL Server is, is a Microsoft product because I've been using it for, for decades now. And I understand there is a tendency people think, okay, well, Azure is a Microsoft product, so I, I should run SQL Server there. Um, 
and and that's just it's just not the case. Um, the and that's not just my opinion, but there have been findings, studies that have been done over the years, and this is an example of a study that was done a few years ago, uh, where this independent company compared the performance and the cost for running SQL Server on AWS versus running it on Azure. They they compared several different size instances and different uh, variables and found that typically they were able to get uh, really double the price performance ratio on AWS compared to Azure. Uh, like I said, this was several years ago though. So another study, different company did another study just last year and again found very similar results and in some cases even higher where it was they they say up to 62 percent um in the price performance comparing aws versus azure and i feel like there's a lot of reasons for this but personally where i like to start is with our global infrastructure because i feel like it's a fundamental difference in the way aws is designed and built we have regions around the world Okay, other people have regions around the world, other vendors, but the way our regions are built is what makes it different. Our, every one of our regions has multiple availability zones. Every one of those availability zones is at least one data center, sometimes multiple data centers. Um, and, and to be clear on that, so these zones are not part of a data center. They are at least one data center. In fact, if we have two data centers across the street from each other or next door to each other, that's one availability zone. Um, where it would be multiple availability zones would be if the data centers are miles apart, there's a separate power grid, a separate floodplain, isolation between the systems. That's where you would see, uh, that's where it would be a second availability zone. Still very low latency between those, and we'll talk about that later. But that's the difference between, you know, one AZ versus multiple availability zones. But it doesn't it doesn't stop there, right? That's that's the underlying base of everything. But the, we've done so much innovation on top of that. We have been running Windows workloads on AWS for almost 14 years now, longer than any other public cloud. Um, and it's not just a matter of running Windows and running SQL Server, but it's all of these innovations built on top of that. And what you see here, I know it's a lot, but but that's it, it's important to see this is just related to Microsoft workloads. This is not this is a drop in the bucket compared to everything that we've done on AWS in that amount of time. And like I said, this is Microsoft workloads in general, but specifically related to SQL Server. You, you basically have two options on AWS, and that is you, you can rehost or you can replatform. I suppose there is a third option of refactoring or you're moving away from SQL Server. But today we're talking about actually running SQL Server on AWS. And so you could rehost, which is very similar to what you're doing today on premises or replatform. Some people refer to this as infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. From an AWS perspective and services, what we're talking about is Amazon EC2 and Amazon RDS. So let's take a look at some of the features for these two, uh, two services. And let's see, you can see right away, there are certain things that are similar and certain things that are you know, a little bit different. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, encryption, encryption at rest is common across both. Uh, we support encryption at rest uh, for all of our EBS volumes, which is our elastic block store where you would typically store the data files for SQL Server. But we also support uh, TDE for the versions and editions that support that as well. Uh, and Windows and, and SQL Server authentication, again, common across both. So what's different between them? Well, 
for starters, RDS, like I said, is it's it's platform as a service. It's a managed service. So that means AWS is going to do that what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, the the what I call the boring tasks, right? So we're going to handle the patching of the operating system, patching of the database. We'll handle the daily backups, and we'll even handle high availability. That frees up your DBAs to focus on performance tuning and improving products and not worry about doing, like I said, those, those boring tasks. Another key difference is the way that they're licensed with with RDS, you can get versions 2012 through 2019, and it's license included. So when you spin up an instance of Amazon RDS with SQL Server, it's automatically going to include that license. You don't have to bring your own license or anything like that at all. Um, the what comes along with that is the fact that because the license is included. It is limited to the versions that are currently supported by Microsoft. So currently that's 2012 through 2019. July of this year, 2012 will go out of support and then we will no longer uh, enable you to spin up new instances on RDS running SQL Server 2012. Now you'll notice on EC2, there's an all. And there's, a, there's a bit of an asterisk there that, that is not on the slide, but I'll explain it. Um, the reason I say there's an asterisk is EC2 supports uh, multiple um, licensing models. With EC2, you can run license included like you can with RDS, in which case it's the same set of versions available as we talked about with RDS, but you do also have the ability to bring your own license to AWS. Now, back in October of 2019, Microsoft modified the rules a little bit with this. And so the short version, the simple version is if the license was purchased before October of 2019, this is the way it works. You can bring that license to AWS you don't need software assurance. You can run it in a dedicated host. Or if you have software assurance, then you can run it in shared tenancy. If the license was purchased on or after October, uh, October 1st of 2019, then to bring that license requires software assurance, whether you're going to run on a dedicated host or, or not. Either way, one of my favorite benefits of BYOL SQL Server is our optimized CPU feature. Because what this does is this enables you to provision a larger instance, but then scale it back, scale back just the CPU count. Now, why would you do that? Well, SQL Server is licensed by core or by vCPU. So if you have a license for, let's say eight cores, that can work for eight vCPUs, but let's say that you're running this on premises today and you realize like it's, I'm not getting the performance that I need. Um, and in analyzing the performance, you realize, well, the problem is I'm getting a lot of disk caching. And I feel like if I had more RAM, that would certainly help from the buffer pool perspective. I could also use that RAM for some of the more advanced features of SQL Server. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details now, but there, but there are different things that you could do there to help without having to buy more licenses if you could keep the licenses at, at eight, if you keep the, the CPUs at eight. So what this allows you to do is you could spin up a larger instance, like it, using the second example here, you could get an R512X large that normally has 48 vCPUs. You turn off hyper-threading, reduce the, the vCPU count to eight. When you now access that, this is you know, Amazon EC2, if you remote into that instance, 
you'll see eight vCPUs, but you'll see the full RAM of the R512X large. You'll have the full network capability, the full uh, storage capability in terms of uh, bandwidth, performance, all of that is going to be at that R512X large level. It's just you're only going to have the eight vCPUs. So let's, let's shift gears for a little bit. And I want to talk about high availability. Because high availability is, is, I believe, one of the biggest benefits of running in the cloud and running with AWS specifically. Because if you remember back to what I talked about before with the way our regions are built, because every region has multiple availability zones, we can, in fact, recommend this type of a, a build out where you have this automatic failover between instances, even though those instances are in separate availability zones that are miles apart. And this is the way I would recommend setting it up for EC2. And you might be wondering, well, what about RDS? Well, RDS, I would say, do the same thing. But the best part about RDS is you don't actually have to worry about it. We're going to do it. All you do with RDS is you just say, I want to run this multi-AZ. It's a managed service, as I mentioned before. So we're going to configure that for you. But that's how it's going to be configured is, is it'll be set up with instances in separate availability zones. If you want to go beyond that one region and you want to, uh, you're looking at disaster recovery, then you can see everything that I talked about before has moved over to the left here. And now we have a second region and you could set up, you know, a second region, a third region. Uh, this is just a, a basic example here, but you'll notice one key difference is the within the region, we do a synchronous commit automatic failover to the second region. Now as an asynchronous commit and a manual failover. Um, and it's not, that's just to, to protect your, your, your system uh, from any latency concerns. We do try to minimize latency, but we're limited by the speed of light. So <laughs> if your primary, uh, in primary instances are somewhere in the US and your secondary is in Tokyo or Frankfurt or, or anywhere else, um, you know, it's best to have that asynchronous commit and just a manual failover for disaster recovery only. But again, you could do the automatic failover within the region. And that's all about getting SQL Server running on AWS. But it, it obviously it doesn't stop there um, because getting it up and running is just the first part. Now, what about managing it and monitoring those workloads? And we do have other services available to help with that. If you're familiar with AWS, we're sure, sure you're familiar with at least two of these, CloudWatch and CloudTrail. There are ubiquitous monitoring and, and auditing services. In addition, we have uh, AWS Systems Manager, which provides a lot of features for uh, managing instances, uh, running administrative tasks on instances, patching, et cetera, and License Manager, which can help, especially with those BYOL scenarios that we talked about. In fact, we have a lot of services, right? not just these four. We have a lot of options available um, because there are a lot of needs and there are a lot of uh, situations that we want to make sure that we can help you manage. Now, I understand that this looks like a lot, but it's important because you might need Active Directory, for instance, which you see here on the left with AWS Directory Service. You might need monitoring, uh, which I talked about with, you know, CloudWatch, for instance, or, or patching with Systems Manager, you know, or any of these other uh, uh, services and, and features that you see here for any of these other purposes. But the reason I like working with partners um, is because 
great companies like Stratus 10 are here to make this easier. They are experts on all this, so you don't need to be. That's why we're here today. Um, to to not hear from me, but, but to hear from from uh, from Kevin at Stratus 10. So, Kevin, I want to turn this over to you. Um, I want to hear your perspective on how Stratus 10 can help everyone here navigate all of those options that I talked about and really take advantage of everything that we've made available. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So one of the ways that uh, Stratus 10 does it is we uh, go about and, you know, we do the work and then we submit to uh, what they call, what is called AWS competencies. And what that is, is it uh, shows that we've demonstrated our uh, AWS technical expertise along with proven customer success by way of uh, case studies or actual projects that we've done, which helps accelerate the uh, cloud adoption journey uh, for those customers. Uh, and we provide them with the business expertise they need, migration modernization tools, uh, education is a big component of it. Um, and we support the customer uh, in the form of either professional services engagement or managed services engagements. So we, we, make, we don't just get you uh, to use the tools, we make sure that you understand uh, what you're doing, the impl implications of, uh, of decisions that you're making. Um, and we help, you, we help guide the customers through all, that, uh, all of that uh, complex decision-making process uh, to get them to a, a good running point. So one of these customers uh, is Learning Upgrade, who has joined us today. So I want to introduce uh, Vinod Lobo, who is CEO for Learning Upgrade. Uh, and I asked that he give us a brief uh, introduction of what Learning Upgrade is and how they're changing the world for the better. And then we'll dive into uh, some of their AWS uh, issues. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, this is Vinod. Um, so Learning Upgrade uh, is a 20-year-old company. We're based in San Diego, and our entire mission is to help people globally, refugees, migrants, people in poverty, to learn English and math and job skills. And so we use uh, a SQL Server database to store all the data related to these students, their teachers, their classes, what lessons they complete. Uh, everything about the students is stored in our SQL Server database uh, on AWS. So something happened a few years ago that moved us to AWS and uh, Stratus 10 and SQL Server. We were the winners of the X Prize, which is an adult literacy X Prize competition to see which company could help someone learn just on their smartphone English uh, to a high level. Um, this prompted us to reach 3 million students in a very short time. Uh, 3 million students means we had to uh, expand our database very quickly. We had to store um, all the student data uh, securely, and we had to do patching everything else to support 3 million students. Um, that happened in 2019, and now we've, we've grown from there. So I wanted to show you what the data looks like. Uh, so this is a student, Sudio, who's a refugee, Somali refugee here in San Diego. And she has seven children. Um, she was at first grade level in reading and math. So she couldn't really help her children with homework. Um, they were much more advanced in English than she was. She enrolled in our smartphone app on her Android phone. And in an 18 month period, she spent 340 hours on our program, and now she has a GED. She's actually taking college classes. Um, we tracked everything she did. So every lesson she completed, the device she was on, she played from 8.15 to 8.30. She got a 75% on uh, um, uh, comprehension and she's moving on. Um, and at the macro level, uh, this is one of our partners, Focus Humanitarian Assistance. We work with them with Afghan refugees in seven countries, including Turkey, Syria, Afghanistan, India, UAE. And um, they use volunteers from Canada 
to help students using WhatsApp and using our program to enroll in, in, in learning upgrade. Um, the shocking thing is six months into using our program, 2,000 students completed 348,000 lessons <laughs> and 44,000 hours. So you can see that what happens with Focus is they take a spreadsheet full of student names and WhatsApp numbers, upload it into our system, it's stored on SQL Server, then WhatsApp messages go out to all the students and they get a username and password and link to our app. So we scale up with data using a SQL Server. This is a, an example of why this kind of data tracking is super important to us. The pie chart at the top is where refugees in Turkey started six months ago. The blue shows that they were all at pre-A1, which means they can't read English, uh, they can't write English, they can't speak. Six months later, the pie chart at the bottom, very few are still in the blue, and some have reached purple, which is sort of the level where you can take college classes, where you can write emails at work, you can get a, a good job, where you have to speak and read and write English. Um, so we take the SQL Server data and create reports out of it, um, which we can deliver to customers to show their impact, track all their students. So what's the future for us? We have a five-year goal to reach 100 million students who are what we call bottom of the pyramid, people in poverty all over the world. So we need to go basically 33X on our database. <laughs> it's a very daunting task. It's made a lot easier by our work with Stratus 10 and our work with um, AWS, but we have huge goals. Um, and this is going to require data, infrastructure, reporting, backup, availability. It, it, everything about this is about scale and reliability and an explosion of, of students in our system. Um, so that's a little intro. And then, uh, Kevin, back to you. Great. Thank you very much for that. So tell us uh, what your infrastructure looked like uh, before you engaged with Stratus 10 and, and we got you moved over to AWS. You know, uh, before this, we actually had a rack, you know, with a SQL server and a rack with an application server. Um, and we were serving files from that and data from that. And, you know, we were very much uh, in the uh, traditional server uh, on a rack where we had to maintain it. It didn't really scale. Uh, we couldn't really upgrade it very easily. Uh, okay. Um, besides from the, the scaling challenges, were there, were there any other challenges that you had with this uh, setup? Well, I mean, the main challenge is we are people that create a learning program, right? We're here to help refugees learn. We're not really uh here to patch sql server and update it and back it up and so we were always kind of worried uh, are we really okay <laughs> you know are we really protected is this really going to work um i think that was the big thing that kept us up at night you know is just we don't have a full-time system administrator or database administrator that can do that okay yeah that's my next question i was going to ask was who who did you have responsible for that or was that task fell, fell on you to, to do yeah, it. Yeah, it, it fell on our staff, you know, our developers, you know, and, and us. And um, we're not, again, we're developers. We create great learning programs. Um, we're very good at the, at the data and the back end and the application server, but we're not very uh, up on um, the, all the nuances of, of scaling a database to reach, you know, 100 million people. Yeah. yeah. So how did you find out about Stratus 10 and what prompted you to reach out to us? Well, we, we were looking for um, a company that was um, somewhat local to California and also a company that where um, when we when we put a ticket in, <laughs> it would be a person that we knew <laughs> as opposed to whoever responds that day, you know, where we could actually get to know some people. Uh, we wanted DevOps done, and so uh, we wanted a company that where we could actually work with, you know, a staff that 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 we could each get to know, and that had a lot of experience in SQL Server and DevOps. Very cool. Very good. Glad to hear. 
Um, so I guess throughout our initial engagement and even now as we continue our partnership, uh, how would you categorize or characterize uh, the working relationship that we have, Stratus 10 and, and Learning Upgrade? Yeah, I mean, obviously relationships take time. Uh, we're se several years in now, but um, what happened is we very quickly got to a point where, you know, we could trust the uh, stat Stratus 10 staff. So when we had to do things like, let's say a spin up databases for uh, the dev server and the staging servers and control access, make sure the developers don't have access to our sensitive student data, a lot of laws around that. Um, those kind of things, it's nice to say, oh, Stratus 10 and AWS have that covered. We don't have to worry about that. That's something we can just ask you guys to do. And now that we, there's a good relationship, basically we don't worry about it anymore, which is wonderful. Very cool. So let's jump back in and put the focus on, on the Amazon RDS service. So what is your, uh, can you kind of describe what your database infrastructure looks like now? Yeah, I mean, we chose RDS because, you know, we can just spin up database. You guys can spin up database for us in minutes and um, we can quickly back them up, quickly migrate data to uh, staging and, and to uh, dev, for example, which we did the other day in minutes with S3 backups. Um, because uh, we're using RDS, it allows me to think we can scale up to 100 million people because with RDS, you know, I can just ask, Kevin, hey, um, as soon as we get to 50% capacity, let's uh, you know upgrade the server, and Kevin can do it in five minutes. And um, you know, this these things are just really easy with RDS. Yes, yeah. yeah. So you know the the speed uh, and stuff is something that it's a tangible benefit that you realize instantly. But uh, can you uh, talk us through some of the more indirect or intangible business benefits that you've uh, gained uh, by using uh, AWS and, and RDS? I'll say a couple of things. One is um, that we've separated our code code pipeline so that we have actually separate. Amazon accounts, completely different AWS accounts for dev staging and production. It really gives me peace of mind that we have security on the production server. And we use something called Amazon Secrets to store our database credentials so that our developers um, can write code and yet not know our credentials for our production servers. Um, this is all managed um, by Stratus 10. Um, another intangible is um, I haven't shared this, I don't think, with, with your team, but we were recently asked by a customer, a large government customer outside the United States said that uh, there's a huge contract possible, but we have to store our data outside the United States in their country. Now, imagine if we had still had a rack and SQL Server on that rack, right? Yeah. No hope. Whereas I can actually ask Kevin, hey, spin up a, a new database um, in Canada and another one in India and another one in Europe so that we meet all the requirements of those governments. Um, and then I can just have our application server point to that database. It's like nothing. It's just an ARN, which is an Amazon uh, resource locator. And we won't even know the difference. I mean, it's, it's just not a big deal. That's one of those intangibles that Amazon RDS gives us um that you know we could never have done um with our own servers very nice well, i look forward to expanding your foot <laughs> yeah um great uh so earlier you mentioned um uh or i might have mentioned that you're also a, a managed service customer um what kind of benefits have you uh seen by being uh being a managed service customer yeah so, I mean, if people don't know, managed service customer means basically that that Stratus 10 manages AWS completely for us, right? And so it means that I don't need to, on a day-to-day -day basis, go in and check uh, uh, CloudFront and see whether server, servers have gone down or do monitoring. Um, I, I can just put a support ticket um, and and add new users, for example. I don't have to do it myself. Uh, I can put a support ticket in and, and uh, uh, ex you know, expand the database or move to annual plans. Also, Kevin 
uh, and his team meet me every month and we discuss, you know, at the same time every, every month and we discuss our, uh, uh, where things are going. It's been extremely valuable. So having managed um, hosting on AWS, as opposed to just um, using AWS, uh, you know, raw, <laughs> it is just a huge benefit because uh, it, it allows our team not to be quote unquote AWS experts. We just ask Kevin and his team to do something, they do it and uh, um, you know, everything is, is just straightforward now. Great, that's always glad to hear that. Uh, well, thank you, Vinod. Uh, it was great having you come share uh, a little bit about your story with Learning Upgrade. Um, this time we're gonna go ahead and segue into our Q&A. And we actually have uh, a question specifically for you, Vinod. Uh, and that is, uh, how, how did you use WhatsApp to deliver your product? Well, that's a, um, that's a great question. Basically, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say an NGO uploads um, 100 refugee names and a WhatsApp numbers into our SQL Server database. Then um, the organization just goes on to uh, hits a button on our system that says send credentials by WhatsApp. All of a sudden, all 100 get a WhatsApp message, which has each of their own usernames and passwords, a link to our Learning Upgrade app to download, and they can instantly be onboarded. Then what happens is every 50 students are put into a WhatsApp group of 50 students, and then their tutor or mentor from the organization, volunteer usually, will communicate with them through WhatsApp groups and send them sort of, you know, if they are in a certificate or if there's an update. So WhatsApp becomes this whole learning community, but also a way to send results, credentials, certificates, reports out to every student. Very cool, very cool. Uh, we have uh, another question here, thank you. Uh, we have another question here asking um, how someone would go about figuring, figuring out their monthly costs uh, for running an RDS. Uh, and the answer really is, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish because uh, there's a lot of factors that you can choose from uh, that will impact your costs. So first, obviously, is the size of your database. Um, next will be uh, what type of database you're using. You're using uh, a community database or, or one like SQL Server that would have a licensing component attached to it. Um, additionally, you know, whether or not you're running as a, as a single AZ or multi AZ where you want that redundancy, that will all come in play. Um, and so the, the costs do add up, uh, but we're happy to help anyone figure it out uh, by running a couple of simulations, asking some questions, and then kind of giving you an idea of, you know, uh, what your range is going to be for, for the cost of, uh, of running RDS. So. Um, let's see here. Do we have any other, I see a couple other questions. Um, Even another question um, would be, you know, how exactly does Stratus 10 help with the migration process? Uh, yeah, so when, whenever we have a customer that is, uh, is looking to do a migration from on-premise or even another cloud provider into AWS. Uh, we go through a predefined process where we'll do discovery, look at all your product or look at all your applications and your servers, uh, performed a sort of um, assessment on all the uh, dependencies, uh, et cetera, determine the best uh, tools to use to migrate your uh, data over, uh, and then uh, you know, calculate out the, the costs of what that will look like once you're fully into AWS. And we'll do all of that before we ever even uh, move a single piece of data. And the reason why is we want to make sure you fully understand the costs, the ramifications, and the impact that uh, a move will have. Uh, and also make sure that you have resources available from your side. Uh, you know, if it's change requiring change of code or anything like that, from our side, we'll take care of all the heavy lifting, moving that data over, creating the, 
the network interdependencies, et cetera. If you have a security team that you want to work with to validate all the settings, we'll do all of that as part of the migration process. But uh, the very first step to it is just reach out to us and uh, say, hey, I want to migrate. So we have another question uh, on licensing, which with, I'm assuming with uh, Amazon uh, is cheaper, which Amazon is cheaper? on licensing, which Amazon is cheaper? Uh, I guess. <laughs> it, it, might, it might be a question about which service. So um, the SQL Server licensing, if you're doing license included, um, it's not so much a, a I mean, it, it, it's gonna be, a little more expensive on RDS because it's a managed service. Um, but uh, the main difference is BYOL versus license included. The question there is, do you have a license that you can bring? Uh, in which case then it's, it's often less expensive to bring your own license, especially if you don't have software assurance, bring that license to a dedicated host on EC2 rather than doing uh, license included either on EC2 or RDS. Uh, but again, if you're doing license included, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a question of weighing the, the advantages of RDS. Do you want a managed service or do you want to manage it yourself? Or like I said before, and, and like Kevin said, the third option, you know, do you want the partner, do you, do you want Stratus 10 to manage it for you? Um, would be the, the third option. Okay. We've got another question here. Uh, is there a service to move a database from Microsoft SQL Server to MySQL? Um, I can take that. So we have the database migration service. Um, and then there's a uh, a separate service along with that called the, the, a tool called the schema conversion tool um, that will allow you to translate uh, basically to to move uh, and do a what we call a heterogeneous migration to move from SQL Server to MySQL or Postgres or or uh, MariaDB and it, it, there are a lot of options for both the source and the destination, but one of those possibilities certainly is uh, SQL Server to MySQL. Um, SQL Server to Postgres has the exact same option, but we have an additional option uh, called Babelfish that works with Aurora Postgres that actually allows an application to work with Aurora Postgres as if it's working with SQL Server. Um, and that's outside the scope of this, but I would say if that's something you're interested in, uh, please you know, either reach out to us or, or reach out to, to Kevin and, and his team at, at Stratus 10. Thank you so much. We are nearing the end of our session. Um, and I just wanted to provide a few resources for you. Uh, to dive deeper into SQL Server, uh, we have a technical lab webinar coming up with Tom Staub from AWS on June 8th. We also have special programs available to help you assess your environment, kickstart your migration process, specifically our accelerated migration program to get a no or low cost migration and a free optimized licensing and TCO assessment. To find out more, contact us, info at stratus10.com. And lastly, we hope you'll take a moment to fill out our feedback survey. It'll pop up in your browser as soon as this webinar ends. We'll also inform you via email once the webinar recording is available. Thanks everyone for attending. Have a great rest of your week.